So it creates this really cool feedback cycle mm -hmm. where you can, over time, get your uh, lookalike audiences to be exactly who is going to be purchasing and buying from you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ecom Growth Show. Let's go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Ecom Growth Show. I'm here, your host, Robbie Switzer. Daniel's not with us today, but we have Nathan. Of course, you guys know Nathan. He runs all things, uh, you know, marketing, in-house marketing here at Shopanova. And with us is Blake. Um, as I understand, Blake, he's a, he's a guy who's really behind the scenes providing solutions on the software side, for, you know, when, when it comes to marketing, currently working with Drip. Uh, doing a lot of email stuff and um, Nathan is going to kind of guide our conversation here today and we're going to get in the side inside of the head of somebody who's actually you know behind some of the the solution side of what we're what we're dealing with in the online marketing world Blake thanks so much for joining us man yeah I'm pumped up to be here super thankful that you guys had in the show yeah man so uh Blake like what uh I know that you had a previous position uh, around here with another e-commerce platform and all that good stuff. Um, talk to me a little bit about your transition and yeah. kind of your journey, how it's been going the past couple months. Yeah, of course. So, uh, like you mentioned, I used to work on the, on the platform side of e -com, so much larger in scope. Uh, we were trying to do a lot at that previous company from the platform perspective, uh, but ended up kind of really falling in love with the, the Drip team and the Drip vision. So, really what Drip is all about is we're really focused on this small to mid-sized brand um, that may be looking at we just moved out of filling out of our of our first warehouse we're growing what do we need to do how do we level up our marketing and that's really where drip comes in and the mission and vision and the team uh, we've got assembled at drip is awesome uh, the role I stepped into is senior product manager over all of our e-com integrations so how we connect with everyone's stores um, other marketing tools that they may be using, all that that fun stuff. I get to kind of uh, direct the vision and direct who and what we integrate with. Sweet. Uh, talk to me a little bit about like, you know, you mentioned the drifts kind of integrating and um, all that good stuff. What does that actually mean for an e-commerce store? I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, people, people hear like integration mm -hmm. and you know, stuff like that, like big words that we talk about, but they don't actually know what that means typically. Yeah. yeah. So when, when you pop up your Shopify store and you go to that app store and you find uh, that perfect app to get you the top bar that lets people know that like, hey, $99 over is free shipping. The way that Drip looks at that is that's part of your marketing. Like holistically, that's part of your marketing campaign. So if that's part of your site, we want to know about folks that are clicking on links like that. We want to know when you're sending messages through a third party platform, Drip wants to integrate with that and house all of that data. So when you're sending emails or SMS through Drip, you know how your campaigns are performing. So a lot of our integration partners are actually brands that you may already be adding plugins for on your Shopify store. And we're just drawing all that data in. So we have one central location to look at how your marketing is performing and kick off those automations right within Drip. Gotcha. So just so everybody at home knows, like we're talking about direct response marketing here. And uh, Blake, can you kind of give me an overview of what is your, I know what my perception is on direct mm -hmm. response marketing. Like what's kind of, what is direct response marketing? What, mm -hmm. what is it exactly for an e-commerce brand? Yeah, yeah. So when you, when you look at like the grand scheme of customer acquisition for a brand that like you're, you want the top of your funnel to be as wide as possible. And let's say you're, you're putting cash into Facebook, you're putting cash into TikTok and you're getting folks on your site. You don't want to have to pay every single time to get that person back to your site. Direct response marketing is that tool you can leverage, whether it's through text messaging or through email or heck, even through snail mail sometimes. You want to react to that over time once you throw required that drip can help you out or sp can help you out from the perspective of email and sms for the most part but when i think about direct response marketing it's that secondary and tertiary and beyond communication that you get with somebody you've paid to acquire onto your site whether it be through abandoned cart whether it be through a welcome or a kind of introduction to the brand flow or even through things like abandoned checkout through sms uh it's that follow-up communication once you've gotten somebody to your site 
Dude, and that's so important too. Yeah. I feel like you know a, I mean? a lot of stores, I feel like a lot of stores just, um, they think customer acquisition is only through paid ads. They think like they're only going, they're always going to have to pay for a customer, you know, through their Facebook ads. And so they're looking really hard at their return on ad spend, but don't realize all the opportunity that they have after they acquire some piece of contact, you know, whether that's an email, a phone number, uh, a card abandonment, stuff like that. And so it's such a valuable piece and it, it just helps the overall efficiency of customer acquisition. So let's talk a little, little bit about that though. So obviously like anybody that pays attention to our stuff, we do the paid side thing. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, when we talk to people, like we love to talk about how to acquire somebody through paid strategies, but what you're kind of getting at is that there's a synergy effect, right? So talk to me a little bit about that synergy effect between paid acquisition strategies, like what we do at Shopper Nova, where we, you know, launch an ad for um, a brand, maybe it's cold traffic, maybe it's a retargeting campaign. Like you mentioned the fact of not having to pay to retarget. I think that that's something that we actually get asked a lot is why should I pay for retarget traffic instead of just doing email or something like that. Um, I think that was that was a question that we got, you know, a little while back and mm -hmm. it kind of blew us away that that's how people were thinking. Like <laughs> it was one way or the other. You couldn't have both. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, like talk to me a little bit about the synergy. Like mm -hmm. why do you want both? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I'll give you guys a really cool example that we really encourage brands to follow. And this is a big time kind of like feedback loop flywheel effect that brands can create. So let's say that a brand has leveraged you guys to run one of their paid campaigns and they're pushing folks to their website and they've got a form or a pop-up that gathers the email. So they've started collecting people off of that successful campaign. Maybe some people buy and check out, maybe some people don't. But one of the key factors here is they've paid um, to get people on their site and now there's some conversion rate of folks that have entered their email and they now own those emails forever. Well, one of the strategies that we're seeing work really well is taking that specific list or audience and then feeding that back into Facebook as a custom audience and then saying, hey, give me the 1% of Facebook users in my target age or geolocation range uh, that look the most like this list I just uploaded. So basically they, they've paid to acquire that audience but now they've just built another retargeting audience that looks more like the people who are likely to sign up or shop on their site. So it creates this really cool feedback cycle where you can, over time, get your uh, lookalike audiences to be exactly who is going to be purchasing and buying from you. So that, I think that's like the best example of synergy where you do want both. You want to constantly be paying to retarget and acquire more people to get to your site. And you also want to constantly be doing remarketing or you want to be sending out emails to those folks who are generous enough to give you permission to email them. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. That's, I mean, you know, one of the things that I talk to uh, with virtually every brain that I've ever spoken to is the uh, omnipresent multi-channel what I call a 365 degree approach. Like a lot of people, you know, they're constantly trying to pick apart their marketing funnel and constantly trying to say, well, do I really need to pay for that? Do I really need to pay <laughs> for that? Do I really need to do that? Um, and at the end of the day, you never really know, like even, even if you like get down into super attributed metrics and all that stuff, you, you never, you can never really quantify the influence that you have mm -hmm. on somebody. Um, you know, you might be able to attribute this click to this ad or this click to that email, but at the end of the day, like, how do you attribute influence? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, you know, talk to me a little bit about that. Like with direct, with direct response marketing, what's the influence effect? Like, is that, is that something that you guys talk about or is that just a paid strategy type of thing? Yeah. The way I think about it is something that builds up over time. It's a lot like like building up uh, like immunity or building strength you're like working out like if you're in a welcome series to a new person who doesn't know anything about your brand uh sending them a welcome series over a couple of weeks can start to get you familiar with the way that your brand's communicating their the products they're offering the things that they're selling maybe enough to get them to click and get back on your site and see a sale or see an offer over there so i look at that as a it's a slow burn almost like it's not oh man 
the first time they saw my welcome series, they didn't buy or check out. They need to move to not interested or cold audience. Like it's a, it's a long play. It's not mm -hmm. as, um, I would say it's not as checkout or purchase oriented as like a paid um, product ad. Like that one, you're trying to drive somebody to a product page to check out and buy. With a lot of email strategies, you're pushing the brand voice, you're pushing kind of thought leadership in your space that's gonna make them aware of your products. So then maybe once they're scrolling through their phone two days later, they get a product ad and they're like, oh, I know these guys. I saw them in my email a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Dude, and I can't emphasize the importance of, uh, like you said, Nathan, a lot of people overanalyze it and they're trying to find, you know, the last touch attribution, which may be an ad, maybe an email. And then they think if that's the last play, if that's where the attribution is, they can actually cut the other stuff out because everybody's trying to save money, trying to build efficiency, trying to optimize. But without the full picture, if you're going to cut a piece out, you're, you're going to suffer the consequences of that because there is, whether you like it or not, whether you can directly attribute it, there is an overall brand awareness. There is an overall brand influence. And so each piece is so important. And that's why you see some brands running pure branding play Facebook ads that don't even push the product or push down the funnel. They're really just like, hey, we're out here and here's what we're about. And some folks see that as like a extravagant expense, but I think it's a crucial part of a lot of brand strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to say it and it builds a relationship where you're not always asking them to purchase and, and that just builds mm -hmm. trust and authority with people. So uh, Blake, with direct response marketing, one of the things that I talk to with virtually every brand that I've ever talked to is the idea of making your marketing stack parallel. So with your paid strategy and your email strategy, whether that person has been looking at your products for uh, 10 days, 30 days, 90 days, you know, so on and so forth. Sometimes it takes somebody 180 days to even a full year to purchase something. Just depends on the product, right? Like talk to me a little bit about how direct response direct response marketing strategies should be parallel with everything else in your marketing stack. Yeah, yeah. I think it's key to a brand appearing uh, consistent and like put together um, across their entire presence. So imagine if uh, your, your paid media has a completely different branding style than your email campaigns, folks could get confused or they could get misled about like, is this the same brand that I'm interacting with? So keeping those things like lockstep and like branded correctly, and even down to the copy that you're using is gonna build familiarity and it's gonna build trust. And then folks are gonna be more likely to purchase. Um, for a specific drip example, we allow you to push folks from custom audiences into Facebook that are in automations. So you can tune what campaigns you have live with your email marketing that's going out over any number of days, even putting like wait two weeks in before you push them to this next email flow, because you know that your retargeting strategy are going to change. You're going to update, copy or refresh stuff like that. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, dude. Something like that makes complete sense to me because I do it on a daily basis. My question is like what you were talking about there, like, like pushing, uh, you know, somebody that's in a custom audience to an email list or something like that. It gets very technical sometimes. Yeah. How yeah. easy, how easy is that? How hard is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Within drip, uh, a single button click. Once you've linked your Facebook, um, like your Facebook business manager account, we'll pull all that info in on drip. You can select the custom audience that you want to move people in or out of. And then you just move those emails back and forth. So there is no, no code required. You just gotta link your account correctly to drip. And I would even say when looking at other ESPs, that level of integration can, it's pretty comparable. Yeah. That's super awesome. Super valuable just to have it be that, that quick and easy. Uh, when Nathan's talking about, you know, running parallels between the different types of contents that are going on in different areas, that's, I've always referred to that as keeping the scent. And so, you know, you always want to make sure that, you know, if you're, if you're going from a Facebook ad to a landing page or from an email, uh, over to another part of the website, you want to make sure that they always keep the same scent. But I think there's, um, uh, there's a tendency for people to want to make sure that everything looks different. They feel like they're mm -hmm. almost being lazy if they're using similar languages, similar imagery, imagery, and especially when they go out and they hire somebody like us or another agency, if we come out with a funnel that looks 
like it piggybacked off of their site. They're like, well, you just copied what, what we did. Like, what are you guys even doing? And the truth, <laughs> that's just like a false way to look at it because the truth is if we create an entirely different experience, you know, in all these different places, nobody's even going to, they're, they're not going to benefit the power from the power of having uh, those parallels in place. And they're not going to benefit from the, the ability to build trust and authority with those customers. Right. Right. And so like right now, Blake, you know, we're talking about quarter four a lot. We're talking about mm -hmm. the holiday shopping season. And for me personally, you know, this is like a big time for direct response marketing for me. Mm -hmm. This is something like, I mean, my email is, is nuts right now. Just, yeah. you know, Black Friday starting super early this year. Mm -hmm. One of the things like in retail, one of the big trends right now is that everybody's saying that the shopping season is going to be longer people mm -hmm. are going to start earlier they're going to be shopping later like it's just one of those things where people are trying to budget out you know different products, different months what we're going to get for this person what we're going to get for that person it's it's chaotic like talk to me whenever we talk about keeping the scent like robbie's talking about quarter one holiday shopping season like how can we do that with direct response marketing yeah, yeah. So when I think about Q4, you have your audience laid in basically at this point of the year. If you're trying to acquire a top of funnel right now, you're probably overpaying for folks who are going to underperform. So it's key to get your emails out and to market to the audience that you've got really, really well. That's when stuff like retargeting really comes up. It's time to spend on the audience that you have. When it's like January 4th or 5th, that is prime time to start acquiring new folks. They're probably sitting, folks have their like wallets full of cash, they had some Christmas money, they're ready to buy something for themselves. And that's when you can start to think about deploying some of these top of funnel strategies. Um, when I think about like 2021 direct response, it's all about SMS to me and, fig and brands figuring out um, how to segment audiences on SMS effectively, and then how to recoup purchases from people on their phones. Sweet, I will say this though. Like we just had a team meeting yesterday and we found out that our CPMs are super cheap right now. This is really, it's the cheapest we've seen. Like as far as, as far as Facebook and Instagram goes, this is the cheapest I've seen it in years, like for this time of year. Um, wow. And I think it's because like Facebook really did this initiative of we're going to push election for two weeks, three weeks. That's that's your time frame to push election. And after the election was over, where they really slapped it hard. They were like, mm -hmm. no more election. It's mm -hmm. now time for all these store owners to start pushing their goods. You know what I mean? We're getting yep. the economy back on track and all that good mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and I really love to see that right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I would say that, you know, what you said about acquiring customer, there's, there's huge value in when I say acquiring a customer, there's huge value in getting people to those product pages mm -hmm. and getting people to put, even put items in their cart and get them ready yeah. to shop for later. Like that, that what we call cart abandon sequence, mm -hmm. whenever we start going after people that have taken a little bit of action on their store, but didn't go all the way. Mm -hmm. Like talk to me a little bit about that during the quarter four season. Yeah, yeah. You want to look at that as a, um, a timely like fallback for some of these folks because they may have added stuff to their cart and then forgotten. So you want to end up in their inbox or you want to end up back in their feed, reminding them and giving them a sense of urgency to check out, especially in Q4, using things like countdowns, using things like last date for free shipping, last date to get by Christmas. That kind of language and copy can really push people over the edge of like, oh, I may or may not get this to like, I need to buy this now if I want it to be here in time for Christmas. And I'll say like a caveat uh, for brands that do use that language about like order by this date to get in time for Christmas, make sure you are dead certain that you can get it delivered by that date mm -hmm. or else you will have people like flaming mad mm -hmm. over social and people aren't afraid to like, uh, just like roast you in the comments of ads. So make sure that you back it up a couple of days even to play it safe. But that sense of urgency is really like so important to Q4. I'm like, hey, you need to order now if you want to buy Christmas. You need to order it now if you want the Black Friday deal. Um, really positioning around scarcity, uh, I think is another really good kind of tactic to take. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, you, you mentioned the SMS thing mm -hmm. and 
that to me is huge. Like when you can, like what you just said about, you know, last day for shipping before Christmas, that's an easy text message right there. Yeah. That's not something that you need to write, you know, a long form mm -hmm. email about. Mm -hmm. So that's an easy text message. I get stuff from uh, Best Buy. I get mm -hmm. their I get their text messages all the time, just about little bitty things. Um, talk to me about the difference between, you know, text messaging automation mm -hmm. and email automation. Yeah, yeah. When you're looking at uh, SMS automation, you want to keep things extremely short in brevity because you're taking up a space that's more personal to a person. Your inbox people are expecting brand information. They're expecting mm -hmm. newsletters and stuff, work emails, that kind of thing. But somebody's like SMS messages on their phone, that's more personal. That's like where their family lives. That's where they've got like baby pictures going back and forth. When a brand shows up there, it needs to be short and direct and to the point, which is ex exactly like you were saying, Nathan, it's the abandoned cart email. It's sorry, the abandoned cart message. It's the um, last day to buy before shipping, or it's the order confirmation. Uh, it's things that are short, that are written, and that are active. If you're trying to send a, like a branding uh, about us series of messages through your SMS campaigns, you're, that's, I would call it that personality, like you're doing that wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, that needs to live in email for sure. So I, I have a quick question. You said, um, do you think 2020, 2021 is going to be all about SMS and the proper segmentation of audience through SMS. When you're talking about uh, segmentation specifically, is that kind of based off of like a, an if that, then this response to those flows that are coming through SMS? Or what did you mean? How are you guys creating segmentation through SMS? Yeah. When I think about segmentation of SMS, it's more about the data behind who I'm sending text messages to. So mm -hmm. SMS... Uh, in general has like a 95 to 99% open rate. And then we're seeing anywhere from 30 to 40% click through rates Dang. of those messages, That's which is crazy. phenomenal. Crazy. Um, and what you want to do is you want to be able to leverage kind of that, that higher click through rate with the right audience. So mm -hmm. it's figuring out, okay, I just sent out a broadcast SMS and here are the folks that click through. What do they have in common? Like, did they all come in through a certain campaign or are they all of my VIP spenders? How can I start to tune who I send an SMS to? So I'm not just sending out a huge broadcast to my entire audience and lighting everybody's phones up all the time, mm -hmm. but instead saying, how can I send fewer messages smarter to the right people? And is it is it ever conversational or is it always just like a quick, quick promotion and a link to get there? I love conversational SMS when it's done right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to do at scale. Like for some of the bigger mm -hmm. brands, it's tough to do because you send something out and then all of a sudden you have 20,000 incoming SMSs that say, yes, I do want to buy this, that kind of thing. But <laughs> when I like, uh, there's a brand called great Jones, they sell like pots and pans, their site's really well designed. And they have this thing called the pot line that basically you can send them off a text message to ask them, uh, like how to clean the stuff you bought from them or, uh, like good recipes for the stuff you got. From. That's where I love conversational SMS is as a branding tool mm -hmm. rather than like, hey, brand, I would like to buy this item. And then they send you a link. Like that kind of stuff can be automated. Mm -hmm. When it comes down to like conversational SMS, I see it as more of like a, a tool to get to know your customer and to get to know the folks that are buying from you better. Mm -hmm. And then what about, uh, you know, building building your SMS list? Is that something where you would look primarily at a paid ads toward existing customer data? Um, you know, if, if that's going to be a driving strategy for 2021, what's the first step to that? The first step is cross pollination. So you get your like 90 day openers and clickers and you let them know that you have a, like a VIP list that's mm. SMS only. So you create demand, you create some scarcity and you blast out that email. So that way you can start to get consent and start to get compliance from those folks that, hey, now I have an SMS audience. And then from there, I would say it's forms on your website that offer somebody the choice to enter their email or their SMS or both. Uh, mm -hmm. The or is key because some people are like, my inbox is too full, just send me a text message. So giving them that opportunity to start opting in uh, with their phone number is great. And I'll even say for brands that have no interest in doing SMS right now, go ahead and put up a phone intake form on your website. Start building that audience. So when you wake up to, oh man, I do need to start sending out texts, you already have an audience built because you can't just opt in people who've bought from you. 
it's one thing that I think is important from a compliance perspective for mm -hmm. people to know is you can't take your customer list and just say, okay, all the phone numbers they put on their order, I'm going to start sending them text messages. That is like, uh, a huge slap on the wrist from Verizon, AT&T, and all those brands. They have to specifically opt into and check the box that says, I want SMS marketing. Right. So, I mean, again, you said some big words in there. You, yeah. You <laughs> talked about, you know, a lot of complicated stuff maybe for some people. For the average online store owner out there that doesn't have a team, maybe a tech team yep. or anything like that behind them, maybe they've just got a few employees that are mm -hmm. helping them out shipping stuff out and stuff like that do you guys have like templates in place and stuff like that for those types of yeah, business yeah we do we have workflow automation templates that you can basically just import into your account and what we have ones for welcome series abandoned cart um for email and sms so if folks don't feel comfortable enough or they don't know the timing that works best for the brand we have best practices laid into the drip platform that if they throw up their hands and say this sounds really complex uh, you can read a couple of our blog articles and at the bottom, there's a, Hey, import this into my account button, um, which I super highly recommend, but really at the core of it, if you're a small, tiny brand and you think you may want to do SMS one day, the one tip that I want to come across is like clearly, clearly encouraging is just get a form up on your website and start collecting SMS numbers. Cool. That's the one step that shouldn't take too much work. What I really like, and this is just my personal tip uh, with SMS, is uh, reviews. Mm -hmm. Like, one of the things that really builds a product is that review badge. Like, whenever you see that review badge, you know, like, if 400 and something odd people have reviewed this <laughs> thing and it's got a four and a half star rating, it's got to be decent, right? Yeah. So, like, with the SMS thing, you know, I really do see that as an opportunity to build reviews for products. Mm. You know, you bought this seven days ago, 10 days ago, whatever it is. Uh, what's your experience been like? Click this link and go review it type of thing. Is that something that you guys do? Yeah, yeah. We integrate with uh, Junip. They're like a verified reviews platform. And you can do that sort of thing through automation right there. Junip will generate a link that makes sure that the buyer is verified um, so that somebody can't just like spam the link out and leave a thousand negative sure. reviews. It's definitely, it's like a verified review mm -hmm. tied to their email, but that's completely something we support. And I agree with you, like the collecting reviews is really important. And then another cool thing is segmenting your audience off of those folks who have left five-star reviews and saying like, I know these mm -hmm. folks love my brand. These guys left five-star reviews. I want to either market to them differently. I want to offer them better like coupons or swag, or even throw them into a, a cheaper retargeting audience to save some money at the end of the day. Sure. Robbie, you got anything to add? No, man. I, I just think I'm, I'm really just start, starting to wrap my head around, you know, what you guys do over at drip, uh, the solution you, you do provide. And it just sounds like really it's a, it's a hub for all things going out in terms of like communicating with your customer, whether that's through email, whether that's through text messages, even collecting reviews, and um, what what other components would it would it include? Is there certain I, I'm, I'm assuming like um, obviously the forms to collect that information, but is there any other part of the website that you guys are interfacing with through this platform? Yeah, so you you would definitely connect your OMS to it. So we pull in all of your order data. You can send out a van and car through drip. Um, all that cool stuff. We also integrate with a lot of other like third party um, marketing providers, things like customer support systems, mm. uh, Zapier, the platform we integrate with that we love um, because Zapier integrates with probably 10,000 other platforms. So by connecting Drip to Zapier, you've now kind of opened up your ecosystem to a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, whether it's Google Sheets, so like you get somebody new, drop them into a Google Sheet, and then you can look and see who all of you've collected in a different place. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with um, the different integrations that you're having. Yeah. And like, like Nathan said, you know, a lot of this, when you talk about it, it, it sounds like to the average person who's running a store, it sounds intimidating. And yeah. what I love about what you guys are doing is you are taking these complex ideas, complex actions and putting into something where you literally just have to click a button. And so really love what you guys are doing. And, and thanks so much for hopping on on today and uh, sharing a little bit more about it and just the importance of having those different touch points. You know, yep. we talk a lot about paid ad strategy, but that's just one piece and there's so much more opportunity outside of that. So again, uh, Blake, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll catch you next time. 
Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.